One of the coolest concepts of evolutionary biology is the idea of mimicry. And actually, I like to talk about this because it really does show the great variety that exists in life when animals are put under certain kinds of pressure, as well as the similarities that exist when pressure is similar, or when there are closely knit relationships between animals in the environment, which exists sometimes, and create things which we call coevolution, where the niches interact with each other and the animals end up depending on each other and putting pressure on each other to evolve in a certain way. Now, before we understand the concept of mimic, we have to discuss the idea of opossomatic coloration. And that's basically when animals have this very weird coloration patterns which are trying to do to send a message to the predators to say, listen, avoid me because you probably won't like me if you eat me anyways because I don't really taste very good. In fact, I might even be toxic and cause you to die. And so please try to avoid me altogether. And that's pretty much what these reptiles, birds, insects are all trying to get across here. They're trying to show to the predators that they're probably not going to be very palatable. Now, the idea is that when a predator will eat one of these, it will feel the taste, they will see that it's bad, and they will actually die. Now, or they will get a bad taste in their mouth and spit it out. And then next time, uh, they will actually learn not to do that again. If they don't die, if they escape the encounter, they will actually remember to avoid this coloration pattern next time. And in fact, some predators are actually born with innate uh, behavior in which they recognize these patterns from birth and then of course that will lead to an advantage and that's why it's so common in the population of those predators because the ones which actually recognize the patterns don't even waste the time or the energy or the risk of trying to attack one of these things and that's why some humans recognize danger when you see some of these brightly color uh, organisms even if we've never seen them before and in fact uh, we also have other kinds of generalistic uh, warning colorations dark animals sometimes scare us and also you have some shapes like you know insect shapes and other kinds of spider shapes which still scare us today because of remnants of this innate process of being scared of things which are might kill us and so that's why a possematic coloration as well as a, a shape sometimes gives animals the uh, warning to avoid these things now the cool thing is that it is possible for you not to actually be dangerous but just look dangerous to try to cheat the predator into not eating you and this is what we call Batesian mimicry and this was discovered by a scientist in the 1800s which is puzzled by the fact that so many different kinds of wasp and butterflies and other animals all look similar to each other and he wanted to understand why that happened he proposed that animals were mimicking each other and that, for example there are several of these wasps and bees which are actually toxic and they're trying to send a message through this yellow and black correlation. But there are some of them which are not toxic at all, they're harmless. But the thing is that they still have that color. And so the birds, unable to differentiate between the ones which are good or not, they avoid them all altogether. And so the idea is here they all work together to send a message to the birds that, listen, you know, I should be avoided. And so this is a coloration pattern that evolved perhaps, you know, in the common ancestor of all of these things, or that evolved separately, convergently in all of these things, so to actually let the message through. Now, the interesting thing is that some of these are not toxic, and they're copying down the mimicking, the models which are toxic, and so they are doing what we call Batesian mimicry, named after base, we discover this. Another classic example of this is actually the Viceroy and the Monarch Butterfly. Now, the Monarch Butterfly is very, very toxic, and if consumed, it would actually cause the birds to throw them up because they taste very, very bad. They're not palatable at all, and they're very distasteful is the word that we use. Now, the color pattern of the Monarch will basically tell the bird to avoid them in that, you know, you're not going to like me anyways. So the birds will learn this or be born with innate behavior to avoid them altogether. Now, the Viceroy it was thought is not exactly as toxic as the, vi the vice the monarch is and so but it, since it looks just like the monarch it sends almost the same message that the monarch does and so the birds tend to avoid the mimic because of the it looks like the model now if the bird ate the viceroy first it would probably have no experience and probably still eat it next time around and but if it actually ate a monarch it will learn to avoid this pattern and in consequence avoid the viceroy as well now, nowadays, we actually understand that sometimes some of these animals all are toxic and they're just kind of mimicking each other. And it's actually the case with the Viceroy and the Monarch. They are, Viceroy is actually toxic itself. And so it's not true Batesian mimicry. Batesian mimicry is when an animal that's harmless 
copies an animal that's harmful, like some of the bees here are harmful, it's, and they actually copy the bees which are harmful. But what about two animals like the Viceroy and the other ones which are both toxic and kind of mimic each other. The idea here is then that um, of Mullerian mimicry and you see here an example of that. Pairs of butterflies which look very similar to each other, uh, more so towards the bottom right than towards the top left and you see here how over time they actually they might change depending on how the look is and you see these first pair here kind of looks like itself but not that much. This pair looks a little more like it. This pair looks almost identical and this one is pretty much the same. Now, so you see, they, there are different levels at which their mammals will mimic each other. And an explanation for this, of course, might be that the pressure to look the same is not as important as other pressures which are overriding uh, the importance of the adaptation of mimicking the model. Now, remember, in this case, they're kind of like co-mimics or co-models to each other because both of them are toxic and both of them are actually trying to work together and mimic each other to send a message to the predator, listen, avoid all of us. You know, it's easier to send a message to the predator that this coloration pattern is dangerous if there's a lot of them in the population so that the predator will learn to avoid um, them quickly as encountering several of them. If they're rare, it will be hard for them to actually um, learn the message from a very rare specimen. So by doubling the availability of, of the look and make it more likely for the message to be learned by the predators or for the predators to develop innate behaviors because of the evolutionary pressure to avoid these kind of coloration patterns. But the index of how much the similarity will be depends on how long they've probably been evolving. Maybe the last pair there has evolved together for a very long time, so the co-evolution between them created very, very similar looks. But maybe this one is still evolving to make uh, mimicry occur. But either way, Mullerian mimicry was suggested by a science called Mueller to explain what Bates couldn't understand, which is why is it that sometimes two harmful species mimic each other. And so that is a summary of the two main kinds of mimicry. We have um, Bates and mimicry, which is when something that's poisonous uh, gets copied by something that's palatable. You know, So the mimic is going to be copying the... Um, model that's actually worse and get from it the same benefits. And then you also have the Mullerian mimicry, which is it's two pairs of mimicries which are distasteful uh, and they all copied each other trying to, together to send a message across that you should, we should all be avoided. Now remember on the example that we gave before, some of these bees are actually both toxic and so they're kind of like mimicking each other, not mimicking um, uh, one that's the harmful one. So it's it's a mixture of what we call Batesian and Mullerian mimicry. And remember that the Viceroy example, although a classic example usually used to teach Batesian mimicry, it's actually an example of something else altogether, which is called Mullerian mimicry, when two harmful things actually mimic each other because the Viceroy and the Monarch are both uh, toxic. But it does look like it's the Viceroy it's copying the Monarch, not the other way around. And we can tell that by evolution, uh, molecular clocking and other kinds of evolutionary evidence and so that's why we still use it to teach baits and mimicry because it doesn't really look like like the uh, monarch is copying the viceroy at all but it may be and that's why they look so similar because they're copying each other and so they're evolving uh, parallel and in conjunction with each other another interesting kind of mimicry is that actually when an animal that's harmful ends up mimicking something that's less harmful than himself in order to successively send the message that it wants to send. See, the thing is, this is a classic example of that, and this is the, the chloral snake and the king snake, and they're a pair of, which is of model and mimic, which are kind of copying each other. But who's copying who, and who's the dangerous one? Now, again, as, it, as I talked about when I talked about baits and mimicry and the other types of mimicry, animals can probably not discern between the one that's dangerous and the one that's last dangerous here, and that's kind of like what they're going for here, that, that one can't describe from the other. But the, there's even a saying that helps you try to remember how this actually works. The one that says red to yellow, it will kill a fellow. And red to black is a friend to Jack. Or red against black, venom lack. Or in red against yellow, kill a fellow. So that means if the red touches the yellow, like on this one, you're in trouble. That's going to be deadly. So this one down here is going to be called the coral snake. This one is less harmful but the, the interesting thing is that unlike baits and mimicry when you would say that the king snake is actually copying the coral snake it's actually the other way around it's the coral snake that's copying the less harmful one so the model is actually the less harmful
Now that has really confused scientists, which were already used to the idea of Bates and mimicry, and even to the idea of Miller mimicry, when they were both toxic and mimicking each other. But this example, that what status thing is completely harmless, you know. So, and then you would think, of course, that that's the one that's making the copy. So, but the thing is, that's not what happens. The thing is, the coral snake. Um, is too toxic. So if it gets eaten, it will kill the predator. And so um, it would be not advantageous for this for this coloration pattern to actually send a message because it doesn't give really opportunities for the predators to learn anything because the coral snake will kill them. And so the predators will never learn the message because of that. But the the king snake it tried to mimic the coral snake's correlation pattern, and then, um, but it's not as bad as the coral snake is. It's, not, it's less harmful than the coral snake is, and so that eventually became the look of the king snake, which is slightly different, still very unique and very coloration. So maybe you'd say that the king snake did baits and mimicry of the coral snake first. And so now it's trying to copy the way that that one looked like. But then the core snake started copying that one. And why is that happening? Why is the other end happening? And just like Belira mimicry is an example of a symbiotic relationship. Here's again an example of them acting together. So first, the harmless one or the one that's less harmful copy the most harmful one. And that would be an example of Bates and mimicry. But then the one that's harmful starts copying the one that's less harmful because it is more efficient for them to copy something that the animals already know to be slightly dangerous or and that should be avoided than trying to teach them a lesson from scratch with a look that ends up killing them so because the coral snakes color pattern doesn't really teach the lesson successively because they end up killing uh, the predator which never uh, goes on to learn the behavior it is more advantageous for the coral snake to look like something that's slightly less harmful and therefore copy the message that the less harmful one is sending so since the birds were already avoiding the less harmful species you end up you know uh, uh, getting an advantage out of that and so that's what we call mertesian mimicry or or ermelian mimicry and this is another advanced type of mimicry that has to do with aposematic coloration now the last type of mimicry that i will talk about is something that we call cryptic mimicry and this is really really cool and it's the idea of camouflage or trying to hide within the environment now this is when you copy uh, structures of the environment or sometimes you copy behavior you cop you copy the um conditions and especially copy the color so that you're going to be able to disappear within the environment or to hide your nest or to make yourself look like something that is going to be harmless so that you can do all kinds of things now this is can be used either defensively or offensively you know a lot of animals use this defensively to escape predators and you've seen several examples here of fish for example can you even spot the fish on this picture it's very very good and there's a nest over here too so these are examples of defensive mimicry here's a, here's another one that's that may be a little defensive you know but it's also you can also use this offensively you know, like, like like the tiger or the prey mantis or, you know, the chameleon or other kinds of fish, uh, which actually will mimic the environments in order to completely escape or detection by the prey so they can come very, very close to the prey or sometimes even attract the prey so that the prey will come towards them and then, you know, they're done. And so this is what we call camouflage or the idea of disappearing within the environment or copying elements of the environment to hide yourself or a structure that's important to yourself like your nest. All right. And you can do this either by behavior or by uh, your actual color pattern. Now, it's actually very interesting. So in the next video, we're going to talk a little bit more about mimicry types that may not exactly involve a post-somatic coloration or hiding within the environment. So I'll see you guys then.